to piggyback on that, what do you all feel pushed that influx of, of, of content? Was there a specific content um, uh, breakthrough or was it a technological breakthrough or was it both? What drove the influx of, of content? I, I think it's really the um, advancement of technology with, you know, internet made things insanely available. You could search and get anything you want and then it made it so you didn't have to wait for your TV shows to be, come to you from the television. You could get videos over the internet. You could get things now on your phone. So I think the the more people have easy access to things, they, the more easier access they want. So we gave them some one thing, they want the next thing. They want the next. And this is never going to be enough. So you have to keep providing more mobile content, you know, live, live streaming content, that sort of, uh, the faster your technology, the faster people want to receive things. So you're for technology before the, the content creation then? It was technology that drove the content creation. I, I think is uh, a huge factor. Mm -hmm. I think uh, I think the content creation, the advancement in the content in terms of quality would would have been there regardless. But as far as the influx of the amount of it, you know, I don't think I don't think a company like Netflix would have created content for broadcast. You know, they, it never would have happened. And look at all the great content that's coming out of Netflix. So I think the technology in some ways did have to come first for the additional content to get created. I think we like we live in a data-driven age too and now uh, there's an ability to pinpoint a viewing audience for a specific genre show or for a specific sort of uh, title that you know 10 or 15 years ago might not have been palatable to a wide audience but now can be specifically marketed to um, people that like that genre show. And so I think that has catalyzed um, the making of more diversified genre programs that can be target delivered to people who really appreciate that. And, and as you know, marketing technology and whatnot gets better and, and, and that evolves, it, you can, you don't need as big of an audience anymore because you're, you're kind of laser focused on the people that really want it as opposed to appealing more broadly. So that could feed into the fact that there's there's so much more content now because th the appetites for that content have been identified and now they're being specifically serviced. Yeah, and maybe people are typing things. The show creators are typing things. Where's Chris? I don't see him. But people are typing things and then we can actually do it. So um, and ultimately actually, it comes down to money, I mean, uh, the reason there's a lot of content is because it's the Netflixes and the Amazons and you know, are, are able to make money. And you looked at the at the graph up there. There's a little sliver of of uh, broadcast networks, and there were four panels of different uh, different groups of of, uh, of cable uh, production. Uh, they seem to be less dependent on advertisers and more dependent on subscribers. And the dollars are there now. Uh, there's talk that you can't always be sure of you know what the dollars are but obviously they're there and but I also think that there's uh, even though I come from the broadcast world uh, I do a, a, applaud Netflix and Amazon for basically jumping off the deep end and saying let's like, like Chris was pointing out earlier let's let's make these shows let's do let's do something and we don't know if it's going to be profitable or not but let's let's spend the money on it and see what happens and I think uh, the bar has been raised so high that people are really now anticipating and expecting these wonderful shows, and then it it generates a group of a new group of young writers that are coming out, and new producers that are coming out, and I think it all just kind of feeds upon itself. I mean, ultimately, it's you know it comes down to money, but if that's what it takes to uh, to create uh, this creative atmosphere that's that in Renaissance is going on now, I think that's I think that's great. I think cable. Television is really, uh, and streaming is really where where it is. I think broadcast networks are very nervous right now, and I don't, you know, every once in a while they'll get a breakout hit, but uh, when you, I hire editors all the time. It used to be, I want editors with really good uh, series experience. Now I get a producer comes in and says, if I don't see a number of cable shows on a resume, I don't think this editor is good enough. You know, that's really what it is. Now the cachet has changed. And, you know, it's changed in another way as well. 
we used to uh, value feature editors, for example. Uh, first question I ask of a feature editor when he comes in interview with me is, I said, do you think you can handle television? You know, it's a, diff it's a different world. What we have to accomplish quickly is just, you know, it's, it's remarkable. Uh, we, we turn stuff out, and uh, I, I do a show called Once Upon a Time with my colleagues from Zoic here. If any of you have seen Once Upon a Time, I will tell you that from the time we lock that show until the time we deliver is three weeks. Let's I look dare any feature to try to do that kind of work. <laughs> Let's talk. That's a good. That's a good segue. Actually, my next question is about the deadlines. How in the world is this happening? Well, they also <laughs> they also throw two hundred seats at it. That's not. <laughs> but, but how is this happening? I want to hear. And, and Armin, we've talked extensively about how you prepare in advance with your clients for and create a true digital backlot for some of the shows that you work on. I'd love to hear from you and and Christina, you in the CG realm. How in the world are we doing this? I think it's the relationship that you have with your producers where uh, you're going to them early on and finding out what's coming up. I mean, <laughs> our shows are the same. We, we pretty much from luck to air is, you know, two weeks, three weeks if we're lucky, um, depending on the episodes. But what we do is we have a relationship with them where even the summer will be like what's coming up for next season. If they know, they'll let us know. And it's something that not only could we keep artists busy during the season and not lay them off, uh, it helps us get a head start, you know, creating something that's going to look better than if you spend, you know, a month and a half on rather than two weeks on. Uh, so that's how we're able to do it. And we, we've kind of established that to them where now they encourage us to kind of do the same thing where if you guys have an idea that you could do in the next month, what would it be? And we'll try to write it in. And that seems to work out as well. I think if you have that communication with them, you're able to make it happen and then just make them realize that the less cooks that are in the kitchen, the quicker things are going to happen. I think what slows us down in the past was there's too many people who have an opinion about how something should look. And uh, it shouldn't be a democracy. I mean, you know, God bless editors, God bless post coordinators, post producers. But if everyone has a say of what it's going to look like before it gets to an EP, uh, and then it gets to the EP and it's wrong, then everybody loses at that point. So it's establishing that relationship, which I think we've done successfully, is there's one person. It should come from us where we think it's right for them. We show it to them. And if they want us to completely change it at that point, that's fine. But at least it's one person that's kind of letting us know. And that's how we're able to make it happen. And, you know, unfortunately, we piss off a lot of editors and post producers. But... Uh, if we didn't do it that way, I don't think the quality would be there and we wouldn't be able to deliver. Yeah, I'd have to agree with everything that you said. Communication's huge. Um, you know, we have to communicate with the client to make sure that we get enough time ahead of time to be able to create the assets. That way they have enough quality for the TV schedule because a lot of the times we won't get plates till a week before we have to deliver. So we have to get all the assets um, finished out and perfected. Um, that way, once we get the shots, you know, we're able to plug in quality assets um, for when we deliver the shots and everything. And how are you, I guess, cultivating that relationship where um, you can only listen to an EP or, or make sure that there's not too many cooks in the kitchen and get, th and get them to invest in the areas that matter if you're working on a, in, a, in a CG heavy show, how are you massaging that relationship and, and getting them to trust you on that level? You threaten them that you're not gonna deliver the show otherwise. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's where the producer relationship comes in, yeah. is constant communication and they need to know you're on their side. You want what's right for the show and what's right for them. And they start wanting to just talk to you. So they skip a lot of the middlemen and go right to you and give you the notes and you wish they would loop the coordinator in because they need to know also, but it's the constant communication. We're involved in the script stage. There's a show right now, one of our big shows, hasn't shot anything and we're already building assets. We know what big set pieces are, we don't know how they're used, we don't know what the shots are gonna be, but we're already starting to build assets. So we get a head start as much as possible on that and then hope we have more than two weeks when the shots actually show up. Yeah, no, I agree, the, 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 the prep is valuable and need to get, not that's the producer, but the art department involved in it. Um, and you know, make it make it collaborative. You know, it's interesting though. There is what I call the visual effects paradox, and you need—I hate to say it—but I think you need enlightened producers to really respond in some cases because 
there's the paradox is if you show a temp visual effect to the producer too early, he said, I don't understand what you're doing here. And if you show it to them too late, they say, well, I have a note on this. And you say, well, that was three versions ago. So you really have to enlist. You talk about communications. You've got to enlist and in some cases educate the, the decision makers as to what level you're at, what stage you're at, you know, how it's going to, how it's going to pr progress. Because you don't want to get stuck in a bind where you're down near the end and you put hours and hours and hours of work into this and multiple renders. And then, well, I wish we had changed this, you know, three weeks ago. So really it's about that communication is really, really critical. And every client's different. So you have to know this client likes to see early versions or this client likes to talk about it a lot and, and <laughs> explain his feelings for what it's going to be but doesn't want to see the iterations. So each client's different. You just have to know how to navigate each show now, back in the day, it was very simple <laughs> <laughs> because you didn't have, <laughs> you, you didn't see the, you, you kind of did it and you got it ready in time to get on the air and whatever it was, it was, you know. The, the same thing happened, in, you know, with, edit, with editing. We got, when we went away from movieolas where you had to, uh, <laughs> you had to splice film, you were kind of locked into these edits. Now, of course, uh, you know, over the last 25, 30 years since, the, the invention of uh, first Ediflex and Montage and Avid. Now the ability to change things around uh, has, has bred uh, a, a, a culture of indecision. And I think the very best producers are the ones who can actually make a decision, know when to say yes. I've always said it's true with the visual effect, it's true with the cut, it's true with a, a, a piece of music. There's probably 100 ways to do it. There's probably 10 ways that are really good. And there's probably three ways which are absolutely spectacularly good. And we spend more time and money going from number three to number two to number one, back to number three, back to number two, because you can't make a decision. It's the guy that comes in and says, you know, this is really good. Let's just go with that. That's what we need. Peter, that's a lot of data. I know that you're, you work on multiple shows at any given point. How are you holding up? Uh, all right. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, it, it's to uh, to go off what they were were saying. Uh, I agree completely. Communication with the client is is crucial. Uh, my biggest show right now, unfortunately, we uh, we're not. The client is not as so easy to communicate with, so we're not fortunate in that sense. But yeah, uh, I think right now I'm on three shows, and uh, you know it's been upwards of five or six, but it's just a matter of taking good notes, <laughs> remembering wh wh what the name of which client is for which show, so you don't get those messed up. But uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but no, it's, uh, it, it's just you got to pay attention to the details and make sure that you, uh, you're you keeping track of what's going on mm -hmm. for each show. Because each show will have like three or four different episodes in-house at the same time. So, you know, three shows, that's 12 episodes. <laughs> it's, it's, so it, is, it does end up being a lot, but it's really just a matter of paying attention to the details. Um, so Eli, from, well, I guess this is for Eli and Paul, from, from a studio perspective, and Armin, you can even weigh in on this too, since you started on the client side of things. Um, how are you looking at vendors? How do you choose your vendors? What do you value at this point um, when you're looking for an effects vendor? Is, are you typically backing into a, a number, or are you consulting vendors first to try to get a more clear understanding of what the budget should be versus what you have? Well, uh, I mean, one of the things Amazon prides itself on is being uh, very creative friendly. And so um, a lot of consultation with the showrunners uh, takes place like early on in pre-production process and things like that. And, and, and our, our content uh, kind of runs a pretty wide gamut um, we have shows like Mozart in the Jungle, which is very effects minimal, um, and then shows like Man in the High Castle, which is much more effects intensive. And uh, you know, obviously, there's not like a cookie cut cutter number for for those two shows. Um, so essentially, it's getting an idea uh, of what the showrunners most want to execute, and kind of constructing, uh, you know, within reason, because uh, obviously we have limits and, and constraints but but um but it's generally trying to identify 
how much can be committed to best deliver the creative desires of the showrunners and uh, the directors. And, um, and similarly, like vendor choices uh, are often made based on what vendors uh, have the creative strength that best, um, that best kind of, you know, brings to life the vision of the showrunner. So, you know, it's just identifying, uh, I mean, we don't, we don't currently have any shows like this, but if it were, uh, you know, creature intensive show, just identifying vendors whose strengths are in, uh, in that CG, or if it's uh, something that's gonna have a lot of, um, you know, uh, panoramic sort of uh, epic wide shots, like just finding a excellent, a, a house that excels in matte painting. We don't make a lot of decisions based, um, you know, solely on budget or solely on, you know, incentives, but mostly what best serves the creative. I work on Mana High Castle, and we do all the visual effects for it. And we're, we're doing estimates in the early script stages. So they're aware of the budget as we go. Mm -hmm. And as they change the script, we adjust our estimate. And we give ranges. So when I'm doing an estimate, I say, I think it'll be around this or this if you shoot it the way I predict, which of course completely gets thrown away when you actually go into production. But there's the back and the forth with the estimates so that they have an idea of where we're at before they go into shooting. Mm -hmm. I'll give you a quick analysis of how some of us pick vendors. Uh, I believe, I firmly believe, that this business is inherently made up of extremely talented people. There's hardly a vendor in this town or in any city that I will refuse to work with because I, they aren't any good. I think they're all good. I think they're all really good. And in lots of cases, especially in visual effects, you have artists that are changing and moving around, supervisors moving around. So I'll never pin on a company said, they're better than another one, they're the best, they're the worst, I'm not gonna work with them. What we will, will do is I think part, uh, part of what, uh, what you said about uh, finding a, a, a particular focus or a strong point for a company, yeah, that's very true. Uh, we, did a, we did a show uh, where we, we the, the biblical show that Chris was talking about is there was a, there was a company that uh, that we use located in Spain that did uh, had done uh, some great biblical and uh, prehistoric architectural renderings in, e in Egypt and Alexandria and they'd done some things that really the, the set extensions were going to be really terrific because we'd seen great examples of their work. Now that doesn't mean that I couldn't go on to uh, any uh, facility in town and saying do you think you can create great architectural extensions. And probably 95% of the vendors in this town, the people sitting in this, this room, would be able to do that. But what we do is we kind of go on what we know and what, we, what, what will make it easier for us to make a decision, that we've seen the work, we know that that's going to pinpoint it, and that's where we want to go. Uh, but very often it's based on something as simple as relationships, the people that we know and trust, uh, are the people that we want to entrust our, you know, multi-million dollar productions to. Uh, there are a, a number of vendors I work with who may never have done a dragon who find it great that here's a show coming along and now they get to do a dragon in it and they end up uh, doing great. And next thing you know is they're known as the dragon people, you know. Um, I think it's a combination of of what do we know about you as a company? I'm speaking in general now. What do we know about you as a company? So what's, what's in our world of you know, acknowledgement? Uh, what's our relationship with the people of that company, whether it's sales or artists or supervisors? Uh, uh, certainly budget will play a role. Uh, very often, more and more in television now, incentives are driving a great deal of it. Uh, I think I would be lying to you if I didn't say that a, a lot of the visual effects is going to Canada and to other incentive-based uh, areas, uh, and, and so, are the, so are the artists and the companies going up there. Uh, and there's a reason for that, because there, uh, there are some generous uh, effects offered to the Dave credit and the OK's credit. These are really, really value important, particularly the studio guy is something that we look at. But above all, the most important thing is the quality of the work. There's no substitute for that. We will never, never sacrifice the, the dollars and say, we want to save, save money, so we're going with someone who we aren't familiar with them, we don't know if they can do the work or not. Or maybe we've seen some 
some uh, product that they've done that wasn't so uh, so you know great for us. I still feel that there are really really solid, uh, talented people working in every every facility, and I'm willing to give them all a chance. So you put all these uh, criteria together, and then you make a you, you make a choice. I did a pilot recently, and I used three. Uh, three company I'd never worked with, and uh, I got some very good work out of it, and I was and I was thrilled to death. And you know, they were recommended to me, so you kind of go with what you know and your gut feeling. I want to pick up on you've used multiple vendors for one show in particular. Um, I understand it from the studio perspective as to why you would have multiple vendors on one show, but I want to hear from from the vendor side. What is that experience like when you inherit a show that maybe five other vendors are working on and maybe you share assets back and forth? How has that experience been for you all? I think that's a nightmare. I'm a big fan of uh, working on the client side before I joined the facility. I used one vendor uh, because that's the only vendor I knew when I turned into a supervisor. And it created a relationship with them for many years where whatever show that I did, I did with them. And they built a team around what served that show. So it made things happen faster, easier, and better because it wasn't always like, oh, let's bid this out with this vendor, send it out here, and manage that. We spent less time on managing uh, where everything was going to go and more time on making the shots as good as we can. Um, And then when I came to the facility side, it was trying to convince clients then that you can actually bring one show to one place and they could do a good job. And that was really hard. And I remember we had early conversations on some of our shows that there's not one vendor that can handle a show this big and be able to deliver on time. And not only did we do that show, we did two others, you know, the same scale. Because again, we were able to build a team that uh, there was a shorthand with everything that we started to do. So I do think there's enough work to go around where all the facilities could benefit from that with the 500, you know, 50 shows. Uh, but I think as, as clients and the studio would be served better where a big show like Once Upon a Time or whatever it may be, it's that one vendor. Again, you have the same artist. It's the same look. It happens faster, quicker, better. Um, so I'm a big believer in that. And as a vendor, you want to take pride in your show. And you want to be like, this is my show, not this scene from this show is mine. So it makes us work even harder for a better project because we know anything that goes out on the show represents us. It's definitely a, a nightmare, like, like you said, dealing with have, having a client that's using you and four other faci- other companies for the same show. Because, you know, like, for example, like let's say the, the, the LUT they're giving you doesn't work. So you have to throw that out and you have to like apply your own color to it. Well, now the other show, the other company's color is not working either. So now you've got to try to match their color. Nothing's worth matching. And then when they see it on their end, everything looks crazy and they think that you're screwing up and you're not doing your job right. But there's, no, there's, there's less communication, not only with the client, but now you're not also not communicating with the other vendors. And you're all having the same problems. But if there was one, one house that was doing absolutely everything, you wouldn't be having these problems. And the shows that I've worked on where it's been one house for, for the show, it's gone so much smoother. And it's just been... It's been a pleasure to work on. Whereas, it, <laughs> you know, it, it, I, I mean, if there was better communication between vendors, maybe it'd be a different story, but there's not. Mm-hmm. And they the try other, to pit you against each other. That is correct. They, and they don't want you talking to each other one on one. You have to go through the production, so you can never just get a straight answer. That on the is, other hand, have you ever sat through end credits of the feature <laughs> <laughs> and seen the 20 different visual effects companies that are rep- represented? Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, I did a pilot uh, where we had literally a minute and a half to get a number of visual effects done, and uh, uh, it, it we we elected on this particular one to use three different companies and to concentrate totally different areas of expertise. One was dealing with some particular underwater stuff. One was dealing with some uh, some superhero type of movements, you know, and. In a case like that, as long as you're not intermingling, it can it can work if you're on a real time crunch. Uh, when that pilot sells, though, uh, now I have to think about how I'm going to look at the VFX profile for the series, and in which case I, I probably am more likely to uh, to veer towards having a single company uh, coordinate that because also you want to have a visual effects supervisor who's available 24/7, and uh, there's a, there's there's arguments in in you know to go both ways. Uh, but I, uh, I I tried once 
I tried once, act, the only time I ever tried it was actually having one shot worked on by two different people. Uh, and uh, we ended up getting it done, but it was not, it was not simple. That was the shot. And, it was, and I, got, I got both of them right here. Both of them right here. And one of them had the architectural, and the other one had the insect, uh, uh, the insects crawling up there. We actually made it work, but it, that, um, I, I won't do that again. Sorry, I'm, so, I'm, so, I'm sorry, Armin. <laughs> so let's move a little to the future. So the deadlines, I doubt they'll get longer. We saw that there's 500 and uh, what was it, 20 um, shows in 2017 alone. What? is the breaking point for visual effects and episodic, if there is one, to be able to meet these deadlines? There's no breaking point. <laughs> we always figure it out. It might not be fun, but we get it done. And it's, it's what we do. <laughs> I think that's, what's, uh, that's so great. The sky, the sky is the limit. And you know, the, 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 the industry seems to always expand. The talent seems to be coming out. One of, you know, one of, the, one of the things, actually, that that uh, the visual effects industry uh, is, is, I hope, is concentrating on now is, is, is training and creating new artists to come in to, 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 to fill this need. Uh, it's, uh, it, and it, it's on a global scale now. I mean, uh, we can get uh, a, sh a shot from uh, Sweden just as fast as I can get it from South Pasadena. You know, that's really, it, it's, uh, it's amazing. So you've got... Uh, uh, you know, a, a whole global uh, industry now, and I think the the uh, it's limitless as to how how much you, how much you can do. I think the the industry is ready to take it on. So we'll just keep going. Yeah, I think it's a matter of finding talent, though. I think that's where we lack as an industry. There's too many technicians and people who know how to use the software, which it's. It's kind of easy to pick up with the newer generation. I mean, software is the easiest thing you could do, but it doesn't make them artists. And that's one thing we face is, you know, the more and more that we hire, you know, some guy would come with an impressive resume, but you realize he has no eye, he has no taste. And, you know, taste is subjective, but at the same time, it's not within what is acceptable. Uh, but in his computer, his nodes say the right things or the math in this simulation. And that's what we're getting more and more of. And I think we're losing the artist part of it. And that's what's going to make this thrive or actually go all out of the country. Because there's some great art artists overseas where it's not about the software. Those kids you know, have like an older version of something. It's not the technology that drives them. It's, it's actually creating something great. And I think, again, what we're lacking here is we're not seeing enough of that. I think a lot of it, too, is um, with everything increasing is being creative and thinking outside of the box of how to assemble shots and create new ways of creating new content and all that stuff. I think that's huge as well. So that way we can kind of keep up with all the new content that's coming our way. So. Have any vendors here ever seen something really cool on the internet, on YouTube or something, and said, I want to get a hold of that guy and, and have him come work for me? We, we've done that. No, there was, um, we had a, a younger artist watching tutorials for this fire and explosion, and we just couldn't get it right for what we needed. And we went to the guy who was actually making the tutorials that our artist was working on, and now we hire him all the time for freelance stuff. He was, it was great. We, he is a find. I will not release his name because no one else can know about him. He is ours. He can keep doing tutorials, but he is ours. <laughs> so if we're playing with the idea that we'll have 10,000 episodics by 2018. Um, how might we need to evolve as an industry to handle all of this? I mean, Armin, you speak about finding artistry again. What does that look like if we just continue to have to churn out these, these shows? I guess you gotta just hire people and try them out. And as vendors, I think what we need to do is we need to try new things. Uh, I mean, all of us kind of work on short schedule TV shows. So it's taking that risk and not listening to someone saying, well, we can't do that in the time that we have. It's almost like taking the risk. Let's see if we can. And if anything, you're going to be either successful or you're going to learn from your mistakes and you're going to do it better next time. And then you'll be someone who's known for whatever that thing is. Um, so it's taking chances, not competing with each other. There's so much work to go around, not bashing each other, because we all know that every like bad visual effects has a story behind it. Uh, we don't always knock it out of the park, but we do the best, you know, that 
everybody's you know we're not we're not Game of Thrones we're not uh, you know man the High Castle where we have the times that we have we literally have a quarter of that time if we're lucky so it's a little different when you work I think in network television it's a different animal mm-hmm. um, so just trying things out you know it's experimentation and when things like um, you know the, the technology can help for example uh, if, if you could if you could learn how to really speed up the, the render farm issues, you know, that you have and compact that. I, I have a feeling that those, you know, technology is going to uh, allow you an instant gratification on some of your shots. You'll be able to see them fast. You'll be able to work on them faster. I think that's going to that's going to help the process as well and give you more workload to take on because because you're able to uh, to review your shots a lot faster. I mean, uh, I'm not a t- I don't know much about the technology, but I know that render farms are pain in the butt. That's what I know. Well, it's funny you should bring that up because uh, there's Amazon Web Services, which <laughs> offers <laughs> amazing uh, cloud rendering capabilities. So just keep we, that. We mind. use that because we're using Amazon shows, so we thought we could get a discount. We don't. <laughs> Perhaps you being on the panel with Eli. Uh, I'll try that. and talk to somebody about that. <laughs> or if you shaved your head, maybe that would. Everyone wants to look like Jeff Bezos, right? <laughs> okay, so what I do, for the whole panel, what are your thought of, thoughts about Netflix investing in Hollywood? How do you think that'll affect or trickle down to the effects industry, if at all? They give us work, right? You know, Netflix, I, if, if someone told me five years ago that Netflix was going to drive the technology in the, in the television industry, I said, you know, you're crazy. But they kind of have, and um, uh, you know, Chris was telling me that the Chris Carter Narcos was the first 4K show that they had done, and uh, my company I'm not personally involved in, but our company does a tremendous amount of work um, uh, with uh, with Marvel and Netflix and working with uh, with the Deluxe Group, um, and the technology uh, is is kind of being driven by Netflix. This is what we want, this is what we demand, and you can not like it, but you end up doing it, and pretty soon everyone's better off for it. And I think that's gonna happen. Amazon uh, uh, did basically the same thing, was working with 4K, uh, and a lot of us, I mean, I remember back, you know, you wanna talk about, let's go back into history. I remember back when someone was saying, we ought to put, do these things in, you know, in six, Super 16, or six, Super 35, and 16 by nine. I was like, no one's ever going to see a 16 by nine image on television. Television is a square, you know. Uh, things catch up, catch up with it now. 4K is absolutely going to be uh, the industry standard in not too long, and who knows how high it's going to go. Of course, that's not necessarily a Netflix issue. That's probably more of a Sony camera <laughs> sales issue than, <laughs> than anything else. But yeah, I think it's. Uh, uh, I think I think Netflix has had a huge a huge influence on uh, the the content and uh, and also on the, the technology. Just by saying we demand this, and everyone has to put their heads together and say, okay, how do we do that? And you come up with a way, and pretty soon you're setting the the standard. That's what that's what uh, happened with. Uh, uh, th- I hate to plug them, but with my friends at Deluxe, uh, they. they they were thrown into uh, <laughs> the, the Netflix 4K world. No one knew knew really how to deal with it. And pretty soon you say, "I got it. Now I know what to do." And now you're you, now you're a leader in it. And others uh, catch on. And pretty soon, this is the uh, this is pro forma workflow in the industry. I think that's going to happen. Any other thoughts? Well, as far as uh, them coming to L.A., I, I, what I hope it means is that there's going to be a lot more production being done in L.A., post in L.A., and more clients in L.A. Because it's a lot easier to deal with a client that you can drive to than one that's in Vancouver or Toronto and you have to email and talk on the phone. You, it's, it's different having that personal contact with them. Yeah. And then also, you know, hopefully it means that more the effects stay in L.A. And I'm sure that will have trickle-down effect on, you know, artist rates... <laughs> <laughs> and us having to like undercut our budgets to try to get the work from other houses and all that other stuff. But I, I hope it does mean more work staying in L.A. and not going out of town. Okay, well, we're going to do a quick rapid round of questions, so get ready. 
and then I'll take questions from the audience. Um, first question, AR or VR? Like a preference? Yes. Quick, 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 quick. All right, I, <laughs> my, my friends who work in VR, they say AR. But I think, I think VR is, uh, as I kind of indicated earlier, if we can get out of the headsets and bring it into a, to a shared experience, I think there's a, there's a future there. Tammy? Uh, I think there's a place for both. I don't know what that is exactly. I have mixed feelings. But I Are think we? AR. I'll say AR. <laughs> I feel the same way. Uh, it's, it's too early. Christina? Um, I'd say AR just because it's kind of in your reality, but like augmented. I don't know. <laughs> I think it's two, two different beasts. I don't know. <laughs> Peter? Uh, I think in terms of uh, entertainment and television movies, VR, but if you're talking about like marketing side, you could use AR probably better. Eli? I'm actually going to go the opposite way. I think, I think, V, I, like I think VR will find more of a place in like medical and education and things like that. But I'm not. I don't. I don't know about uh, as entertainment. I, I think. I think AR is engaging people better in terms of them being entertained. But okay, we have already seen uh, one of the first episodics in in VR. Where will television or episodics go in the next twenty years? Maybe even five. <laughs> I can't even imagine what's going to happen tomorrow. <laughs> Tammy? I'm just trying to make my deadlines now. I just don't know. Armin? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I think there's just a lot of room to grow, and I think it'll change. So. I agree with her. There's a, there's a lot of room uh, for it to grow. There's a lot of uh, gimmicks that come up that maybe will be around for like a year or two and then might fade away again. Like, will VR take off as, like, the next big thing? I don't know. I'll probably, I'm not going to put on a he headset, like he said. You know, I'm, I would want something that I can just walk into. Or is it going to be, like, a more of an interactive thing where you get to choose what's going on? I don't know. But I think there's definitely a lot of possibility. Mm -hmm. Want to buy my 3D TV? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> Eli? I need you to repeat the question. Sorry. I, I think I need to remember the question. <laughs> Five years down the line, twenty years down the line, where will TV be? What? Where will? Where will? will we, programming be, or where yeah. will television technology be? Te well, I guess both. Uh, what do you see? Uh, I I don't think programming will will change too much. It might get to a place where you have even more choice in what you watch, but that's that's. Fine. I think there will be a contact lens in which I will just watch TV constantly, that's not, and I'll you won't even know it. I was going to say, the, th the theaters are going to be the, be the <laughs> size of a building, and we're going to watch TV on the, on the watch. That's, that's what okay, last one. First memorable um, television experience that you can remember. You mean the make... show that blew you away. The first television show that blew you away. When I mean, for me, watching? Yeah. Uh, oh. Watching. Uh, before the Twilight Zone, there was, a, <laughs> there was a show called Panic. This was back in the 50s, and it scared the hell out of me. And that's when I said, this is, this is powerful stuff. I was like eight years old. Look it up, panic. It was really, it was creepy. And the Twilight Zone kind of worked its way out of that. It was, it was great. Uh, my favorite TV show was The Munsters. Cause <laughs> I don't mean to go with the token <laughs> goth kid uh, show, but uh, I, I loved the practical effects of the creature and the macabreness of it all. And, but yet everybody still happy and goofy and pleasant. That was my big experience. <laughs> Mine was solid gold, actually. <laughs> and I used to try to record it, but I used to sing at the same time. And I couldn't figure out why my voice was on there when I was recording the TV. I was really young at the time. So yeah, solid gold was my show. <laughs> um, I'd say there's a lot of good ones out there. Um, Avatar, I think, was a pretty good one. Just how beautiful everything was um, and how they kind of pushed the envelope on it. For television? Sorry. No worries. <laughs> um, I really loved Fringe. Um, you know, they had a lot of different things on different episodes, creatures, um, different elements to kind of help drive um, some of the stories and stuff. Probably the first show that, like, really 
got me hooked. Uh, I mean, I, I have been a huge TV fan my entire life, but uh, The X Files. I was, was gonna say huge, X-Files. That was what I was. I was gonna say X Files. <laughs> yeah, it, it was just that incredible. Piece of crap. <laughs> I didn't think you'd steal X Files. You're so much younger than me, but uh, it was it was the X Files for me. Also, I don't know the supernatural and tie in with government bureaucracy. And I had a huge crush on Gillian Anderson too. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what, one X Files visual effects story. The very first season before it was a hit, <laughs> we had a sequence where a little a boy is abducted, uh, and we had a down shot of the top of the motorhome and around the motorhome. The, uh, the, the bushes were all singed, and Mulder figures out that it must have been a spaceship because it was, the heat was so intense that the, uh, the, 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 the shrubbery was all <laughs> singed. And we got the dailies, and I looked at it, and I said, the, the top of the motorhome is pure white. I said, now, why would it be pure white if there was all this heat? So I went to the, the head of production at Fox, and I said, it'll cost me $100 on a hairy to make the top of the motorhome black, and I had to argue with him for 10 minutes <laughs> before he would let me spend the $100 to blacken the top of it. He said, no one's going to notice that. Well, we, uh, we went a long way since then. <laughs> Although the fun thing is that it was really you know, rud- rudimentary. We were doing, st- it was great. 19, don't forget, 1993. Imagine the state of visual effects in 1993. I mean, Harry was even new, I think, then. Henry came out like the year after that, and we did a lot of our visual effects in an online bay, actually. We just, you know, it, it was it was great, and that's what was so that was kind of fun about those early the development of uh, of the visual effects profile on television because you kind of learned on the job and you kind of created stuff, and then um, uh, you say, oh, that that looks that looks pretty good. That looks pretty good. That was a fun show. I was also an important show for me. So thank you all. This was a great conversation. I'm going to take any questions now. I saw a hand back there first. Uh, visual effects history. Uh, Image West had a Scanimate. Image West. Scanimate. Scanimate. That's what it was. That, it was. Uh, it, was uh, it was. And it was very, very. Uh, it was like far out, you know. But it was now. It's like you know, uh, like elementary school. But that was that was a, that was the state of the art right there. I'm glad you remember that. Thank you. Image West. This hand was next. Uh, are any of you uh, exploring the use of uh, real time rendering, like with uh, Unreal Engine or Unreal Engine? The question is: Are any of you exploring any real time rendering, like Unreal Engine? We are. It's a busy delivery. <laughs> to experiment, Eddie. <laughs> Okay. Next question here. Can you guys talk about your experience to manage so many shots in such a short period of time? What, what's the, what's the uh, workflow and the management style that you're trying to – are you working with ShotGun? Are you trying to keep things together? Or is that data making? Is that your only way? What, what's your experience? We the use quest- ShotGun. The question is, um, how are you all managing so many shots in such a short deadline? Are you using ShotGun? What kind of management tools are you employing? We use shotgun as well. We use shotgun, and we have one coordinator per show. So although one producer will handle many, many shows, one coordinator is dedicated to that show. Sometimes they'll have multiple shows if they're smaller, but that way at least one person is the point person at all times on it. Yeah, on our on our big shows, we have one producer per show. They have their own coordinator, and then we have other coordinators that kind of manage departments. So it's, it's really – I mean, shotgun's great. It, it helps you manage, but it's the people that you have around you that – We uh, – at- at Stargate, we, we don't use Shotgun. Uh, we actually have a pr- uh, proprietary program that was written in-house that is more of a, it's an artist-based program, but it has some features for uh, the producing side and it helps us manage uh, all the shots. It's, it's similar to Shotgun, though. Next question. Here. Uh, there's one thing for Ray that's been kind of a big effect for you, kind of the virtual studio experience and environment format going on with the Zoic. The question is, do we see visual effects houses existing in the future, or do we think studios are going to have 
in-house effects and have many studios. Studios have tried that. They failed. So it's not a new concept. I think Paramount did it. When I started in the business, they called, uh, was it PD Square? Is that what it was called? Yeah, I, yeah, it failed miserably. I, I don't know if any other studios tried it, but... A, a couple shows that we're on that are smaller, they'll bring on an artist or two to work in-house, and then they send us the rest. But they don't want to have to manage anything more than what they already have to handle. So they don't seem to want to have that. Barnstorm actually started out as a company that would go to you. They started out with two guys in the garage. They would go to the client side, work with you directly, and then they had to expand and become a facility. So I don't think they're going away. Yeah, I've seen the situation where there's been, th the client will have like a v VFX person on their team and they'll try to hand them the easy stuff so that they can save some money. But if anything that's over the guy's head, then they give it to us. Yeah. Do, do they want to know how, did CBS Digital start as, as a company, as a, as a network? Uh, own company because they're they're thriving. We're, we worked we're on one of the shows for CBS Digital. That's you could only get it if you pay for the subscription service. Mm. But we were the vendor entirely. They didn't have anybody in house except for to do like temp comps. They'll do some timing things with the editor, yeah. but we would finish. And I think they did a lot of that remastering of Star Trek, if I'm not yeah. mistaken, and stuff like that. And I don't think they do anything that complicated. And sometimes it's show specific. I think Universal Television, you know, set up kind of a department for. Um, a battle star and things like that, but uh, but I don't think it was a company wide. Uh, yeah, I don't think I, I think the studio was involved, but I think it was its own thing, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, yeah. it was Universal Heartland. Universal Heartland. Yes. Um, question for Peter: If you had one piece of advice as a vendor to give to client side visual effects people to make the vendor's life easier. The question is for Peter. If you had one piece of advice to give to the client side from the vendor, correct? Um, what would it be? It'd just be better communication. Anything they they can tell us or can give us, like concept art or just any information about what's going going to going to happen in an upcoming episode. The sooner the better, because a lot of times they wait, and you know, like one client will have a new 3D model that you're going to have to use, but they won't give you the okay to, to do anything with it yet. And it's like, well, just let us start, you know, looking at it, making sure that we can actually use this thing. Like, no, 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 not yet. Any Anything that they can do earlier on to communicate with us and let us know what's going on and what to expect, then we can plan for it. And if we can't plan, if we can plan for it, then it'll go better. But if we can't plan for it, then it's just going to be a surprise two weeks until it's due. I can take one more question. So the question is for Armin. How do you um, how do you work with your clients or market your team when producers or clients are looking to tax for tax incentives elsewhere? I think I've just kind of explained to them over the years that for me be, to be able to do what I do for them, that my team needs to be here in LA. Um, we've tried. I mean, we have a small little Vancouver office. We've tried to send things like that and. Uh, it works sometimes, but as far as like the big effects, just the interaction that you get on a one-on-one -on -one basis is never the same. I mean, you could Skype, you could do whatever. It's still not the same because you could go behind somebody and point out something and it's done. And because of the schedules that we have, I don't see any other way that we could do it. Um, I mean, ultimately, I, I don't know if it'll come down where the quality doesn't matter to them anymore and they do say, well, no, we do have to do it somewhere else because the rebate's more important. Uh, I mean, but for the time being, you know, the fight that we're putting up, you know, we seem to be winning. Um, we'll just see how long it lasts. So that's all we've got for you tonight. Thank you so much for joining us. I hope you enjoyed tonight's conversation. Thank you all for talking with me tonight. One shot worked on by two different people. Uh, and uh, we ended up getting it done, but it was not, it was not simple. That was the shot, and, and I, got, I got both of them right here, both of them right here, and one of them had the architectural, and the other one had the, insect, uh, uh, the insects crawling up there. We actually made it work, but it, 
that um, uh, I won't do that again. Sorry, I'm, so, I'm, so, I'm sorry, Armin. <laughs> so let's move a little to the future. So the deadlines, I doubt they'll get longer. We saw that there's 500 and uh, what was it, 20 um, shows in 2017 alone. What is the breaking point for visual effects and episodic, if there is one, to be able to meet these deadlines? There's no breaking point. <laughs> we always figure it out. It might not be fun, but we get it done. And it's, it's what we do. <laughs> I think that's what's uh, that's so great. The sky, the sky is the limit, and you know the, the 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 industry seems to always expand. The talent seems to be coming out. One of you know one of the, one of the things actually that that uh, the visual effects industry uh, is is I hope is concentrating on now is 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 training and creating new artists to come in to, 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 to fill this need. Uh, it's, uh, it, and it, it's on a global scale now. I mean, uh, we can get uh, a, sh a shot from uh, Sweden just as fast as I can get it from South Pasadena. You know, that's really, it, it's, uh, it's amazing. So you've got uh, uh, a, a whole global uh, industry now, and I think the, the uh, it's limitless as to how, how much you, how much you can do. I think the the industry is ready to take it on. So we'll just keep going. Yeah, I think it's a matter of finding talent, though. I think that's where we lack as an industry. There's too many technicians and people who know how to use the software, which it's it's kind of easy to pick up with the newer generation. I mean, software is the easiest thing you could do, but it doesn't make them artists. And that's one thing we face is you know the more and more that we hire. You know, some guy would come with an impressive resume, but you realize he has no eye, he has no taste. And, you know, taste is subjective, but at the same time, it's not within what is acceptable. Uh, but in his computer, his nodes say the right things, or the math in the simulation, and that's what we're getting more and more of, and I think we're losing the artist part of it, and that's what's going to make this thrive or actually go all out of the country. Because there's some great art artists overseas where... It's not about the software. Those kids, you know, have like an older version of something. It's not the technology that drives them. It's it's actually creating something great. And I think again, what we're lacking here is we're not seeing enough of that. I think a lot of and this and everyone has to put their heads together and say, okay, how do we do that? And you come up with a way, and pretty soon you're setting the the standard. And that's what that's what uh, happened with the. Uh, uh, I hate to plug them, but. Of my friends at Deluxe, uh, they, they they were thrown into uh, <laughs> the the Netflix 4K world. No one knew knew really how to deal with it, and pretty soon you say, "I got it. Now I know what to do." And now you're you, now you're a leader in it, and others uh, catch on. And pretty soon, this is the uh, this is pro forma workflow in the industry. I think that's going to happen. Any other thoughts? Well, as far as uh, them coming to L.A., I, I, what I hope it means is that there's going to be a lot more production being done in L.A., post in L.A., and the more clients in L.A. Because it's a lot easier to deal with a client that you can drive to than one that's in Vancouver or Toronto and you have to email and talk on the phone. You, it's, it's different having that personal contact with them. Yeah. And then also, you know, hopefully it means that more of the effects stay in L.A., and I'm sure that will have trickle-down effect on, you know, artist rates... <laughs> <laughs> and us having to like undercut our budgets to try to get the work from other houses and all that other stuff. But I, I hope it does mean more work staying in L.A. and not going out of town. Okay. Well, we're going to do a quick rapid round of questions, so get ready. And then I'll take questions from the audience. Um, first question, AR or VR? Like a preference? Yes. <laughs> quick, 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 quick. All right, I, <laughs> my my friends who work in VR they say AR, but I think I think VR is uh, as I kind of indicated earlier. If we can get out of the headsets and bring it into a to a shared experience, I think there's a there's a future there. Tammy, uh, I think there's a place for both. I don't know what that is exactly. I have mixed feelings, but I Are think we? AR. I'll say AR. <laughs> I feel the same way. Uh, it's, it's too early. Christina, um. I'd say AR just because it's kind of in your reality, but like 
augmented. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. It's two, two different beasts. I don't know. <laughs> Peter? Uh, I think in terms of uh, entertainment and television movies, VR, but if you're talking about like marketing side, you could use AR probably better. Eli? I'm actually going to go the opposite way. I think I think V uh, like I think VR will find more of a place in like medical and education and things like that, but I'm not I don't I don't know about uh, as entertainment. I, I think I think AR is engaging people better in terms of them being entertained, but Okay. We have already seen um, one of the first episodics in, in VR. Where will television or episodes? Right, if there was all this heat. So I went to the, the head of production at Fox, and I said, it'll cost me $100 on a Harry to, to make the top of the motorhome black. And I had to argue with him for 10 minutes <laughs> <laughs> before he would let me spend the $100 to blacken the top of it. So no one's going to notice that. But we... Uh, it went a long way since then. <laughs> Although the fun thing is that it was really, you know, rudi rudimentary. We were doing, it was great. 19, don't forget, 1993. Imagine the state of visual effects in 1993. I mean, Harry was even new, I think, then. Henry came out, like, the year after that. And we did a lot of our visual effects in an online bay, actually. We just, you know, it, it, was, it was great. And that's what was so, that was kind of fun about those early the development of, uh, of the visual effects profile on television because you kind of learned on the job and you kind of created stuff. And then um, uh, you would say, oh, that, that, looks, that looked pretty good. That looked pretty good. That was a fun show. I was also an important show for me. So thank you all. This was a great conversation. I'm going to take any questions now. <laughs> I saw a hand back there first. Image West. Scanimate. Scanimate, that's what it was. That, it, was, uh, it, was uh, it was, and it was very, very, uh, it was like far out, you know? But it was, now it's like, you know, uh, like elementary school. But that was, that, was a, that was a state of the art right there. I'm glad you remember that. Thank you. Image West. This hand was next. The question is, are any of you exploring any real-time rendering, like Unreal Engine? We are too busy delivering. <laughs> Experiment, Eddie. <laughs> okay. Next question here. Can you guys talk about your experience to manage so many shots in such a short period of time? What, what's, the, what's the uh, workflow and the management style that you're trying to keep? Are you working with Shotgun? Are you We the, use que shotgun. the question is, um, how are you all managing so many shots in such a short deadline? Are you using shotgun? What kind of management tools are you employing? We use shotgun as well. We use shotgun, and we have one coordinator per show. So although one producer will handle many, many shows, one coordinator is dedicated to that show. Sometimes they'll have multiple shows if they're smaller, but that way at least one person is the point person at all times on it. Thank yeah, on our, on our big shows, we have one producer per show. They have their own coordinator. And then we have other coordinators that kind of manage the department. I'd say AR just because it's kind of in your reality, but like augmented. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> it's two, two different beasts. I don't know. <laughs> Peter? Uh, I think in terms of uh, entertainment and television movies, VR. But if you're talking about like marketing side, you could use AR probably better. Eli? I'm actually going to go the opposite way. I think I think. V, uh, like I think VR will find more of a place in like medical and education and things like that. But I'm not. I don't. I don't know about uh, as entertainment. I, I think. I think AR is engaging people better in terms of them being entertained. But okay, we have already seen um, one of the first episodics in in VR. Where will television or episodics go in the next twenty years? Maybe even five. <laughs> I can't even imagine what's going to happen tomorrow. <laughs> Tammy? I'm just trying to make my deadlines now. <laughs> I just don't know. Armin? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I think there's just a lot of room to grow, and I think it'll change. So, 
I agree with her. There's a, there's a lot of room uh, for it to grow. There's a lot of uh, gimmicks that come up that maybe will be around for like a year or two and then might fade away again. Like, will VR take off as like the next big thing? I don't know. I'll probably, I'm not going to put on ha- headset like he said. You know, I'm, I would want something that I can just walk into. Or is it going to be uh, like a more of an interactive thing where you get to choose what's going on? I don't know. But I think there's definitely a lot of possibility. Mm-hmm. Want to buy my 3D TV? <laughs> <laughs> No. <laughs> Eli? I need you to repeat the question. Sorry. I, I think I need to remember the question. <laughs> Five years down the line, 20 years down the line, where will TV be? What, where will, where will, will we, programming be or where yeah. will television technology be? Te- well, I guess both. Uh, what do you see? Uh, I, I don't think programming will, will change too much. It might get to a place where you have even more choice in what you watch, but it's, that's fine. I think there will be a contact lens in which I will just watch TV constantly, that's what I was, and I was, you won't even know it. I was going to say, the, th- the theaters are going to be the, <laughs> the size of a building, and we're going to watch TV on the, on the watch. That's, that's what okay, last one. First memorable um, television experience that you can remember. You mean the make, show that blew you away. The first television show that blew you away. When I mean, for me, watching? Yeah. Uh, oh. Watching. Uh, before the Twilight Zone, there was a, <laughs> there was a show called Panic. This was back in the fifties, and it scared the hell out of me. And that's when I said, "This is this is powerful stuff." I was like eight years old. Look it up, Panic. It was really, it was creepy, and the Twilight Zone kind of worked its way out of that. It was it was great. Yeah, they keep providing more mobile content, you know, live live streaming content, that sort of. Uh, the faster your technology, the faster people want to receive things. So you're for technology before the the content creation. Then it I, was technology that drove the content creation. I, I think is uh, a huge factor. Mm-hmm. I think uh, I think the content creation, the advancement in the content in terms of quality would would have been there regardless. But as far as the influx of the amount of it, you know, I don't think I don't think a company like Netflix would have created content for broadcast you know they, it never would have happened and look at all the great content that's coming out of Netflix so I think the technology in some ways did have to come first for the additional content to get created I think we like we live in a data driven age too and now uh, there's an ability to pinpoint a viewing audience for a specific genre show or for a specific sort of uh, title that you know, 10 or 15 years ago might not have been palatable to a wide audience, but now can be specifically marketed to um, people that like that genre show. And so I think that has catalyzed um, the making of more diversified genre programs that can be target delivered to people who really appreciate that. And, And as, you know, marketing technology and whatnot gets better and, and, and that evolves, it, you can, you don't need as big of an audience anymore because you're, you're kind of laser focused on the people that really want it as opposed to appealing more broadly. So that could feed into the fact that there's, there's so much more content now because th- the appetites for that content have been identified and now they're being specifically serviced. Yeah. And maybe people are typing things. The show creators are typing things. Where's Chris? I don't see him. But people are typing things, and then we can actually do it. So um, and ultimately, actually, it comes down to money. I mean, uh, the reason there's a lot of content is because the Netflixes and Amazons and you know, are, are able to make money. And you looked at the at the graph up there. There's a little sliver of of uh, broadcast networks, and there were four panels of different uh, different groups of of, uh, of cable uh, production. Uh, they seem to be less dependent on advertisers and more dependent on subscribers. And the dollars are there. Now, uh, there's talk that you can't always be sure of you know, what the dollars are, but obviously they're there. And, but I also think that there's, uh, even though I come from the broadcast world, uh, I do a, a, applaud Netflix and Amazon for basically jumping off the deep end and saying, let's... Man, of uh, working on the client side before I joined the facility, I used one vendor, because uh, that's the only vendor I knew when I turned into a supervisor, and it created a relationship with them 
for many years where whatever show that I did, I did with them and they built a team around what served that show. So it made things happen faster, easier and better because it wasn't always like, oh, let's bid this out with this vendor, send it out here and manage that. We spent less time on managing uh, where everything was gonna go and more time on making the shots as good as we can. Um, and then when I came to the facility side, it was trying to convince clients then that you can actually bring one show to one place and they could do a good job. And that was really hard. And I remember we had early conversations on some of our shows that there's not one vendor that can handle a show this big and be able to deliver on time. And not only did we do that show, we did two others, you know, the same scale, because again, we were able to build a team that uh, there was a shorthand with everything that we started to do. So I do think there's enough work to go around where all the facilities could benefit from that with the 500, you know, 50 shows. Uh, but I think as, as clients and the studio would be served better where a big show like Once Upon a Time or whatever it may be, it's at one vendor. Again, you have the same artist. It's the same look. It happens faster, quicker, better. Um, so I'm a big believer in that. And as a vendor, you want to take pride in your show. And you want to be like, this is my show, not this scene from this show is mine. So it makes us work even harder for a better project because we know anything that goes out on the show represents us. It's definitely a, a nightmare, like, like you said, dealing with have, having a client that's using you and four other, other companies for the same show. Because, you know, like for example like let's say that you, the the lut they're giving you doesn't work so you have to throw that out and you have to like apply your own color to it but now the other show the other company's color is not working either so now you got to try to match their color nothing's worth matching and then when they see down there and everything looks crazy and they think that you're screwing up and you're not doing your job right but there's no there's there's less communication not only with the client but now you're not also not communicating with the other vendors and you're all having the same problems but if there was one one house that was doing absolutely everything, you wouldn't be having these problems. And the shows that I've worked on, where it's been one house for the, for the show, it's gone so much smoother, and it's just been it's been a pleasure to work on. Whereas, it, <laughs> you know, it, it, I I mean, if there was better communication between vendors, maybe it'd be a different story. But there's not. And they the try other. to pit you against each other. That is correct. They, and they don't want you talking to each other one-on-one. -on -one. Oh, nice. You have to go through the production, so you can never just get a straight answer. That on the other hand, have you ever sat through end credits of the feature? <laughs> <laughs> and seen the 20 different visual effects companies that are rep <laughs> represented? Uh, uh, I did a... Uh, my biggest show right now, unfortunately, we, uh, we're not... The client is not as so easy to communicate with, so we're not fortunate in that sense. But... Yeah, uh, I think right now I'm on three shows, and uh, you know it's been upwards of five or six, but it's just a matter of taking good notes, <laughs> remembering wh wh what the name of which client is for which show, so you don't get those messed up. But uh, uh, <laughs> but no, it's uh, it's, it's just you got to pay attention to the details and make sure that you uh, you're keeping track of what's going on mm -hmm. for each show because each show will have like three or four different episodes in house at the same time, so. You know, three shows, that's 12 episodes. <laughs> it's, it's, so it, is, it does end up being a lot, but it's really just a matter of paying attention to the details. Um, so Eli, from well, I guess this is for Eli and Paul, from, from a studio perspective, and Armin, you can even weigh in on this too since you started on the client side of things. Um, how are you looking at vendors? How do you choose your vendors? What do you value at this point? Um, when you're looking for an effects vendor, is are you typically backing into a, a number or are you consulting vendors first to try to get a more clear understanding of what the budget should be versus what you have? Well, uh, I mean, one of the things Amazon prides itself on is being uh, very creative friendly. And so... Um, a lot of consultation with the showrunners uh, takes place like early on in pre-production process and things like that, and 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 our, our content uh, kind of runs a pretty wide gamut. Um, we have shows like Mozart in the Jungle, which is very effects minimal, um, and then shows like Man in the High Castle, which is much more effects intensive, and uh, you know obviously there's not like a cookie cut cutter number for for those two shows. Um, so essentially, it's getting an idea 
uh, of what the showrunners will most want to execute and kind of constructing, uh, you know, within reason, because uh, obviously we have limits and, and constraints, but, but, um, but it's generally trying to identify w how much can be committed to best deliver the creative desires of the showrunners and uh, the directors. And, um, and similarly, like vendor choices uh, are often made based on what vendors uh, have the creative strength that best, um, that best kind of, you know, brings to life the vision of the showrunner. So, you know, it's just identifying, uh, I mean, we don't, we don't currently have any shows like this, but if it were a, you know, creature intensive show, just identifying vendors whose relationship with them for many years, where whatever show that I did, I did with them, and they built a team around what served that show. So it made things happen faster, easier, and better, because it wasn't always like, oh, let's bid this out with this vendor, send it out here, and manage that. We spent less time on managing uh, where everything was going to go and more time on making the shots as good as we can. Um, and then when I came to the facility side, it was trying to convince clients then that you can actually bring one show to one place and they could do a good job. And that was really hard. And I remember we had early conversations on some of our shows that there's not one vendor that can handle a show this big and be able to deliver on time. And not only did we do that show, we did two others, you know, the same scale, because again, we were able to build a team that uh, there was a shorthand with everything that we started to do. So I do think there's enough work to go around where all the facilities could benefit from that with the 500, you know, 50 shows. Uh, but I think as, as clients and the studio would be served better where a big show like Once Upon a Time or whatever it may be, it's that one vendor. Again, you have the same artist. It's the same look. It happens faster, quicker, better. Um, so I'm a big believer in that. And as a vendor, you want to take pride in your show. And you want to be like, this is my show, not this scene from this show is mine. So it makes us work even harder for a better project because we know anything that goes out on the show represents us. It's definitely a, a nightmare, like, like you said, dealing with have, having a client that's using you and four other, other companies for the same show. Because, you know, like for example, like let's say that you, the, the LUT they're giving you doesn't work. So you have to throw that out and you have to like apply your own color to it. But now the other show, the other company's color is not working either. So now you've got to try to match their color. Nothing's worth matching. And then when they see it on their end, everything looks crazy and they think that you're screwing up and you're not doing your job right. But there's, no, there's, there's less communication, not only with the client, but now you're also not communicating with the other vendors. And you're all having the same problems. But if there was one one house that was doing absolutely everything, you wouldn't be having these problems. And the shows that I've worked on where it's been one house for the, for the show, it's gone so much smoother. And it's just been, it's been a pleasure to work on. Whereas, it, <laughs> you know, it, it, I, I mean, if there was better communication between vendors, maybe it'd be a different story, but there's not. Mm -hmm. And they the try to pit you against each other. That is correct. Bit. And they don't want you talking to each other one-on-one. -on -one. Oh, really. You have to go through the production, so you can never just get a straight answer. That On the is... other hand, have you ever sat through end credits of the feature? <laughs> <laughs> and seen the 20 different visual effects companies that are rep represented? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I did a pilot uh, where we had literally a minute and a half to get a number of visual effects done. And uh, uh, it, it, we, we elected on this particular production uh, they seem to be less dependent on advertisers and more dependent on subscribers. And the dollars are there. Now, uh, there's talk that you can't always be sure of you know, what the dollars are, but obviously they're there. And, but I also think that there's, uh, even though I come from the broadcast world, uh, I do ap ap applaud Netflix and Amazon for basically jumping off the deep end and saying, let's, like, like Chris was pointing out earlier, let's Let's make these shows. Let's do, let's do something. And we don't know if it's going to be profitable or not, but let's, let's spend the money on it and see what happens. And I think uh, the bar has been raised so high that people are really now anticipating and expecting these wonderful shows. And then it, it generates a, group of, a new group of young writers that are coming out and new producers that are coming out. And I think it all just kind of feeds upon itself. I mean, ultimately, it's, you know, it comes down to money. But if that's what it takes to... Uh, to create uh, this creative atmosphere that's that in Renaissance is going on now, I think that's, I think that's great. I think cable, 
television is really uh, and streaming is really where where it is. I think broadcast networks are very nervous right now, and I don't you know every once in a while they'll get a breakout hit, but uh, when you I hire editors all the time. It used to be I want editor with really good uh, series experience. Now I get a producer comes in and says if I don't see a number of cable shows on a resume. I don't think this editor is good enough. You know, that's really what it is. Now the cachet has changed. And, you know, it's changed another way as well. We used to uh, value feature editors, for example. Uh, first question I ask of a feature editor when he comes in interview with me is, I said, do you think you can handle television? You know, it's a, diff it's a different world. What we have to accomplish quickly is just, you know, it's, it's remarkable. Uh, we, we turn stuff out, and I, I do a show called Once Upon a Time with my colleagues from Zoic here. If any of you have seen Once Upon a Time, I will tell you that from the time we lock that show until the time we deliver is three weeks. Let's I look dare any feature to try to do that kind of work. <laughs> Let's talk. That's a good. That's a good segue. Actually, my next question is about the deadlines. How in the world is this happening? Well, they also <laughs> they also throw two hundred seats at it. That's not. <laughs> but, but how is this happening? I want to hear. And, and Armin, we've talked extensively about how you prepare in advance with your clients for and create a true digital backlot for some of the shows that you work on. I'd love to hear from you and and Christina, you in the CG realm. How in the world are we doing this? I think it's the relationship that you have with your producers where uh, you're going to them early on and finding out what's coming up. I mean, <laughs> our shows are the same. We, we pretty much from lock to air is, you know, two weeks. We do all the visual effects for it. And we're, we're doing estimates in the early script stages. So they're aware of the budget as we go. Mm -hmm. And as they change the script, we adjust our estimate and we give ranges. So when I'm doing an estimate, I say, I think it'll be around this or this if you shoot it the way I predict, which, of course, completely gets thrown away when you actually go into production. But there's the back and the forth with the estimates so that they have an idea of where we're at before they go into shooting. Yeah. Well, I'll give you a quick analysis of how some of us pick vendors. Uh, I believe, I firmly believe, that this business is inherently made up of extremely talented people. There's hardly a vendor in this town or in any city that I will refuse to work with because I, they aren't any good. I think they're all good. I think they're all really good. And in lots of cases, especially in visual effects, you have artists that are changing and moving around, supervisors moving around. So I'll never pin on a company that said, they're better than another one, they're the best, they're the worst, I'm not going to work with them. What we will will do is I think part uh, part of what uh, what you said about uh, finding a, a, a particular focus or a strong point for a company. Yeah, that's very true. Uh, we, did a, we did a show uh, where we, we the, the biblical show that Chris was talking about is there was a, there was a company that, uh, that we use located in Spain that did, uh, had done uh, some great biblical and uh, prehistoric architectural renderings in, e in Egypt and Alexandria, and they'd done some things that really, the, the set extensions were going to be really terrific because we'd seen great examples of their work. Now, that doesn't mean that I couldn't go on to uh, any uh, facility in town and saying, do you think you can create great architectural extensions? And probably 95% of the vendors in this town, the people sitting in this, this room, would be able to do that. But what we do is we kind of go on what we know and what, we, what, what will make it easier for us to make a decision, that we've seen the work, we know that that's going to pinpoint it, and that's where we want to go. Uh, but very often it's based on something as simple as relationships. The people that we know and trust uh, are the people that we want to entrust our you know, multi-million dollar productions to. Uh, there are a, a number of vendors I work with who may never have done a dragon who find it great that here's a show coming along and now they get to do a dragon in it and they end up uh, doing great. And next thing you know is they're known as the dragon people, you know. Um, I think it's a combination of, of what do we know about you as a company? I'm speaking in general now. What do we know about you as a company? So what's, what's in our world of, you know, acknowledgement. Uh, what's our relationship? That is more of a, it's an artist-based program, but it has some features for uh, the producing side, and it helps us manage all the 
shots. It's, it's similar to shotgun, though. What's this? Here? Uh, there's no screen spread. It's just kind of the VFX video can. The virtual studio is kind of like the burn form of doing the actual video. Like, you know, you know, you pack up. Do you see the effect uh, vendors existing in the future? Or are the ADCs and Amazon Studios just going to start doing this when the company is for sure? The question is, do we see visual effects houses existing in the future, or do we think studios are going to have in-house effects and have S many studios? Studios have tried that. They failed. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's not a new concept. I think Paramount did it. When I started in the business, they called, uh, was it PD Square? Is that what it was called? Yeah, I, yeah, it failed miserably. I, I don't know if any other studios tried it, but... A, a couple shows that we're on that are smaller, they'll bring on an artist or two to work in-house, and then they send us the rest. But they don't want to have to manage anything more than what they already have to handle. So they don't seem to want to have that. Barnstorm actually started out as a company that would go to you. They started out with two guys in the garage. They would go to the client side, work with you directly, and then they had to expand and become a facility. So I don't think they're going away. Yeah, I've seen the situation where there's been th the client will have like a v VFX person on their team, and they'll try to hand them the easy stuff so that they can save some money. But if anything that's over the guy's head, then they give it to us. Do they want to did CBS Digital start as as a company as a, as a network? Uh, own company because they're they're thriving. Or we worked on one of the shows for CBS Digital. That's you can only get it if you pay for the subscription service. Mm. But we were the vendor entirely. They didn't have anybody in house except for to do like temp comps. They'll do some timing things with the editor, yeah. but we would finish. And I think they did a lot of that remastering of Star Trek, if I'm not yeah. mistaken, and stuff like that. I and don't think they do anything that complicated. And sometimes it's show specific. I think Universal Television, you know, set up kind of a department for. Um, Battle. Battlestar and things like that, but uh, but I don't think it was a company wide. Uh, yeah, I don't think I, I think the studio was involved, but I think it was a, its own thing, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, yeah. it was Universal Heartland. Universal Heartland. Yep. Yes. Um, question for Peter: If you had one piece of advice as a vendor to give to client side visual effects people to make the vendor's life easier. The question is for Peter. If you had one piece of advice to give to the client side from the vendor, correct? Um, what would it be? It'd just be better communication. Anything they they can't.